It's a company, General 150. And welcome to another XM Comedy Special. I'm Sonny Fox. Tonight, it's the story of two guys that changed the face of comedy. Perhaps the most influential duo since Abbott and Costello. It's the story of Cheech and Chong, as told by Tommy Chong. It's an amazing story, and it all began at our XM Comedy Studios in Washington, D.C. XM Comedy, I'm Sonny Fox, and in the studio with us is Tommy Chong. Hey, how's, how's, how's the... White House. Uh, I never went by there, actually. It's, just, it's not worth the trip. <laughs> <laughs> I went by there. You, you go by and watch the protesters, man. They're funny. Well, actually, they put a guy. They, they, they're like two blocks away now. They put a thing up so you can't get as close as you used well, to. Well, last time I was there, I was there for the book show and, uh, and this, you know, some guy in a cardboard box, you know, <laughs> protesting something or other. I, I can't believe you're actually here. You're a legend. It's actually the great Tommy Chong. The great Tommy Chong. The fantastically interesting, funny guy. Yeah, you are. And you got a book coming out called Meditations from the Joint on Simon yeah. & Schuster. When's it coming out? This weekend? It's out. And so, oh, it is. Uh, yeah, it got released. It's I in bookstores. I, I thought I had a scoop. Oh, that's okay. Oh, they, they tell all you guys that. Yeah, I know, <laughs> right. Oh, you're the only one, Joe. <laughs> I love only you. We promise. <laughs> but the, the thing goes from your uh, childhood in Canada right on through your... You're uh, coming up against the Bush administration and everything. It's uh, how, it's it covers everything, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, it's a it's, it's a quick read, and uh, and yeah. When I started, well, you know, I didn't intend to do a book. I, I just write. I just like to write. And then uh, uh, Simon and Schuster, the ladies over there, you know, they said, you know, give us some. You know, what do you got? I, I I said I got some writings, and so I handed them. Handed everything I had over to them, and then they uh, put it into a book, and I'm really pleased with it. Well, well you're an icon. You really are. It's, you've got quite a story. I mean, how many people live your life? Yeah, I <laughs> well, I've been around. You know, I'm 68 years old, so yeah, I was going to say I you're... got uh, lots to talk about. <laughs> well, let's start back at the beginning. You're born in Edmonton. I, a lot of people didn't know you're Canadian. Yeah, yeah, born in Edmonton. Yeah, a lot of people. You know, they can't tell us apart. Cheech and I apart. So. <laughs> Uh, you know. Well, no, um, I, you're the, you're the, actually, I've always heard through the years, because when you've been around long enough, you hear all these yeah. stories, and, and when you hear them enough, you be, begin to believe them, but yeah. I was always told that, well, Tommy, he's the, he's the smart one, he's the one who saved all his money. He's, <laughs> you know, he's the guy, he's rich, you wouldn't fucking believe how rich he is. Cheech really is the smart one, you know, like he's the most educated, and he, he won uh, Celebrity Jeopardy, so... He did? So, yeah, he, he won, he beat everybody, he beat, uh, what's the guy with the electric car? Um, Ed Bigley Jr.? Really? Yeah, he beat him, and, um, uh, what's his name, you know Michael King, the one that owns uh, all that, uh, everything, King Television? Right. I was, he's a neighbor of mine, and he was telling me, because I thought that that, that Jeopardy thing was fixed, you know. <laughs> and he said, no, no, it wasn't. And Ed Bigley Jr. was on the same panel as Cheech, and Cheech kept pushing the button. And then Ed Bigley said, there's something wrong with my button. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Michael King says, no, man, you know, you're just slow. Cheech had all the answers. He won. Wow. So Cheech really is the, the, the brain, but I'm, I'm the guy. I'll tell you how smart I am. My wife handles all my business, so uh -huh. that's 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 my genius. Well, actually, I didn't know this, but I did a little study up on you, and you, I didn't know you directed all the movies. Yeah, uh, I did. But the first one, well, who took it? Lou Adley take credit for the first one? He took credit, and he actually, you know, he was in the director's chair, but he was coming to me first, you know. Well, because before we, we, had... we, we wrote as we went, you see, so he, you know, it wasn't like he had a finished script in front of him, so he, he had to come to me, and, uh, and, and, and in the end, I, I have to take credit, I saved it, because uh, he, he had a cut, his director's cut was so bad that <laughs> Paramount gave the movie back to him. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, they said, oh, we, we, we can't release that, you got it. They, they, he, he literally, he, he helped Fox to me, he got it back, and then I changed the ending. I wrote the ending, you know, there, it, was, it needed a new ending, because Lou's, Lou's uh, ending was, it was all a dream. 
And you know how unfulfilling that is. Yeah, really. And then, uh, so then I wrote the ending, you know, where we just go on to other uh, other adventures, and uh, and the rest is history. $100 wow. million. Dollars. It grossed over $100 million. The first one? In the studio with us is Tommy Chung. Well, before we get to the movies, though, I want to go back to uh, 1938. You're born in Edmonton. Yep. And you, uh, after a little while, but first of all, you, you got quite a mix in the family. Your father's uh, uh, Chinese. Yep. And your mom cool. is a Scotch-Irish. That must have been quite a blend. It was a beautiful blend. Well, look at me. <laughs> very, very handsome guy. Yeah, right. Around the time I was born, my, my dad, uh, he homestead. He, he had a homestead uh, north of Edmonton. But he sold it before they discovered oil on that property. You're kidding. <laughs> no, it was one of the biggest oil wells. I bet he tells that story a lot, doesn't oh, he? Oh, <laughs> no, no, no. He's embarrassed. He died a few years ago, but he he, he was he was a very, very beautiful man. No, he, 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 was, he was alive, though, long enough to see your success, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. He enjoyed the success. Although he used to tell me after he get off stage, he'd go, I don't know, son, you, you speak pretty rough. <laughs> speak, you talk kind of rough there, son. <laughs> what's, what's the first thing you bought your dad? Uh, I guess a house. I bought him, my mom and dad a house wow. in, in Vancouver, Vancouver Island. But I still have the house. Yeah, I got the impression you're one of those guys that really, really enjoyed walking around, looking like an old hippie with rags on and being rich <laughs> as shit, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, well come know, on, admit it. The truth is, man, there's nothing. Ha there's no one happier than a rich hippie. Right. Nobody happier. <laughs> I, you know, I've done, that's why when Cheech, Cheech wanted to change the act, you know, like when we got together again, he goes, uh, you know, we're supposed to do a movie, and he wanted to change it, you know. And I said, oh man, come on, <laughs> I've been making, I've been doing this for thirty some odd years, <laughs> you know. Why would I want to change? You can imagine, I got paid. That's why, you know, people don't believe me. You know, when I I tell them, you know, when I went to jail, you know, it was. Uh, I, I felt so blessed, you know, that I had such a blessed life, you know, because I've made a, a living. And talking about smoking dope. Oh, yeah. I mean, back then, the people forget. You know, they've seen movies like Half Baked. But back th then, that was the first time. Yeah. That yeah. was it. I mean, I mean, a movie about smoking pot. What? Yeah. They had no idea what it was. In fact, we, Cheech and I, are responsible for all these warnings on the label now. You know, excessive drug use, excessive right. talk, you know, drug talk. Before that, they had no clue. And, and same as our albums, you know, when we started making our albums, they, there was no warnings on them, you know, so right. <laughs> my funniest well, story... I don't know, the fact that the, the whole uh, album looked like a big the, uh, package of bamboo uh, rolling papers... Uh, but they, 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 <laughs> people had no clue what, 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 what we're doing with the rolling paper, you know? Oh, well, you have no many, idea. You know how many uh, uh, ounces of pot was cl were cleaned in between the <laughs> double sleeve? <laughs> Can you know. imagine? Oh. Pounds. Speaking of that, by the way, let's play a track from Cheese and Chuck. Okay. I want to ask you: it, Was Dave a real guy? Was that inspired by yeah. a real person? Yeah, actually, actually, I'll tell you the story. You want to play the bit first? And I'll no, tell no, you the story. Tell me the story now. You want to hear the story of Dave? Yeah. Right here? Yes. Yeah. It was our very, very first bit. What happened? Uh, Lou Adler, you know, the producer, he he came to the last show we did, or one of the last shows we did at the Troubadour. It was uh, an open mic night, uh -huh. and Cheech and I were like regulars there. And he, he, he came and he saw, he had heard about us, and then he came and saw us. And we heard that he was there, so uh, Cheech phoned him up and said, we want to meet with him. And Lou said, okay. So we went for the meeting, and, and we went into Lou's office, and, you know, he had, he had been uh, producing all the Carol King records at the time uh -huh. and so his record he had uh, gold albums all over his office and so yeah, we sat down and this is what so what, what can I do for you and I said well uh, we want to make a record you know I lived around of course it's a record company so and he says okay what do you need and I says a thousand dollars and a tape recorder <laughs> and, he, and he says okay and he starts telling Cheryl the secretary to make a check out for a thousand I said a uh, thousand each <laughs> <laughs> that was my big uh, negotiation there. And he said, okay, so he wrote a thousand each, and we took the tape recorder, and, uh, <clears throat> and then we went into the mix-down room uh, next door to his office. It was a, a screening room, no. and it was nice and air-conditioned inside the room, but outside in the courtyard, the entrance was hot. It was so hot. It was, the sun was, it was about 110 degrees out that day. <clears throat> and Cheech... 
so we we're, were going to, you know, act through the first bit. And, and the bit was supposed to be, Tish knocks on the door, I let him in, we talk, and, and we we talk about dealing pot or something. Huh. So Tish went outside, and the door locked from inside, so he was locked outside. <laughs> and it was hot out there. And so he knocked on the door, and so he, he knocked, and I went, who is it? <laughs> and he goes, it's me, man, I got the stuff, let me in. And so then... I, I was staring at the tape recorder, you know, and it wouldn't, the needle wasn't moving, and I stared at it for a long, long time, and then Cheech got tired of waiting, he knocked again, boom, 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 and this time the needle jumped, so I knew it was recording, so then I thought, well, I'll start the bit over again, so I go, who is it? <laughs> and this time Cheech is a little, little annoyed, he goes, it's me, man, I got the stuff now, let me in, I think the cops saw me. So then I just never said anything. I knew, I knew the bit. I just waited and waited and waited. And then finally he knocked. But this time he was a little angry. I said, Who is it? <laughs> he goes, it's me, Dave, man. I got the stuff. Now let me in. <laughs> And he said Dave because Dave was my first partner, uh, and that was the first name that jumped into the teacher's, teacher's head, was Dave. <laughs> and I said, Dave? And he said, yeah, Dave, now let me in, it's hot out here, man. <laughs> and I said, Dave's not here. <laughs> and there was the bit. He went nuts, man, he's banging on the door, let me in, man, it's not funny, it's hot, god damn it, come on, I'm <laughs> melting out here. <laughs> so I opened the door and he came busting in, he's mad, throwing his costumes all over the place. And I thought he was going to hit me until I said, listen, 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 I played it back for him. And we laughed, we laughed, we played, played it over and over and over for about an hour. <laughs> and then, then we went around and showed it, listen, let everybody hear it, you know, we, and then Lou heard it and Lou said, okay, we got to record this. And so then we went into the studio that night and the next morning that bit was being played across America. And there, here is the beginning of Cheech and Chong. That's the very first recording that Cheech and Chong did, actually, uh, on all their albums and movies. We're talking to Tommy Chong. He's got a book uh, out, just came out, called Meditations from the Joint, which we'll get to because he spent some time there recently. But it's about your whole life. When you were a kid back in, uh, in uh, Calgary, uh, yeah. you used to, when you got some money, you used to go, you were a big movie freak back then, weren't you? You went like from movie house to movie house. Oh, yeah. Well, that's that's what you did. I mean, it was very cheap. When I was very young, uh, it cost a nickel to get in. Five cents. Uh -huh. Five cents to get in and see, like, you yeah. know, all the movies until you got a headache, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Roy did they, Rogers. Did, did they have the cereals? Yeah, the cereals. So you had a love of movies back then. Ah, right? uh, big love. Big love. And all the Bowery Boys. That was uh, the comedy that I grew up with. And you can see a lot of Bowery boys in Cheech and Chong, you know. Right. And uh, Abbott and Costello, I wasn't that, you know, they were okay. Martin and Lewis, when I got older, you know, they put me on the floor. Like Jerry Lewis used to just, I, I was, you know, you'd laugh so hard you hurt yourself. Now, why do they refer to the, uh, the neighborhood you lived in as Dog Patch? <laughs> That's actually my, my description. Oh, is remember, it? The, uh, remember the... Uh, well, Ladner. Little Abner right. cartoon. Are you saying well, it was backwards, Tommy? Or what? <laughs> no, we we lived on the fringe, and the fringe is is that the area beyond building inspectors. You know, the building inspectors would stop at at the edge of uh, edge of the city, and then from that point on, it was like shanty town. You know, you could throw up anything, and it was fine. In fact, m although my dad, when he bought the house there, he paid five hundred bucks for a for a little cottage. And it was in the middle of a field. I mean, that's the kind of uh, houses. And they had tar paper shacks in those days. And this is a country where it got down to 20, 30 below zero weather. I was going to say, that's Canada. That's the, 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 it seems to me when the wind blew hard, you'd have to outdoor have plumbing. A shack. <laughs> outdoor plumbing, you know, totally no lights, you know, there's kerosene lamps. Well, somehow yeah. in this dog patch era, though, moving yeah. along to you reached yeah. the age where, well, most of us were learning to masturbate. You were playing the guitar. Yeah, I was ten years old. I learned how to play guitar. Yeah, I, I really wanted to learn the fiddle, but I couldn't tune it. But I, I, I learned how to tune a guitar. And, and uh, what was your first electric guitar? What kind? Uh, the, uh, 
Les Paul Jr. Really? Les Paul Jr. Yeah, oh, I was, was going to say, yeah, that's classy compared to... I was 16, I was about 16 years old when I got that. Well, you, I played an acoustic guitar right up until until I got my first electric. I ask because I was uh, in a band in the 60s. Uh, we played in these clubs down the ghetto area of Grand Rapids, Michigan. We used to go, oh. across, we used to go across the street to this blues club. It was all black neighborhood. Sure. And uh, the old blues guys, they had some of the strangest guitars, like Kingston's, and with eight yeah. pickups on them, you know. I yeah. didn't even know where they came from, these guitars. <laughs> and and did, they, did they strip the G-string, or the, yeah, the G-string to make it, give it that metal sound? Oh, yeah, and, the, and, and every headstock had like 18 cigarette burns on it, you know. Oh, yeah, I, I even had, had one made with the cigarette burns. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, myself. you started a band called The Shades. Uh, let's move along to when you were actually uh, getting paid to play, right? Well, I, I, I hooked up with this Indian, a full-blooded Indian uh, in uh, in Army Cadets, and he played guitar. I was playing accordion at the time. Really? I, I, I loved accordion. You I play had, a lot of instruments then. Yeah, uh, but uh, but I would always go back to guitar because that that's, uh, was the easiest one to play with. So I, I so I was instead of accordion, I started playing guitar with him, the Indian guy. And then I met this black football player, Tommy Milton, and uh, and he was a singer. And uh, he was one that he, we got the Les Paul Juniors together. Except he never played his. I, I played mine. Uh -huh. And then we had a little, a little Fender amp that I used to share with my brother. He was a bass player. And we ran the bass and and the guitar through a, a one 15-inch speaker oh, amp. Oh, boy. That must have sounded great. <laughs> it sounded wonderful. It had that fuzz tone, you know. Did you use the reverb on the bass, too? Oh, there's no reverb in oh, the Oh, bass. cheap model. Right? No, no. It was not on the bass, anyway. And, um, <laughs> yeah, and we said, we had a blues blues band it was hot we were the hottest band in, uh, and the reason we were was because the, the porters that worked the, the trains would bring up the records from the states they were called race records at the time right they are on, on uh, 78's and we would learn them and we learned like Bo Diddley and all those uh, you know Muddy Waters well that music Howling uh, Wolf yeah. that music inspired you to become a writer you actually you wrote Does Your Mama Know About Me which made the charts in this country right I gotta tell you how that happened it was weird man I'd never done coke until that the the day before I wrote <laughs> wrote this uh, uh, does your mama know about me and I, and I you know at the time it wasn't as dangerous as it, you know as it is now and I did just the tiniest little bit of coke and I got that energy and I I wrote the song does your mama know about me I did just the tiniest little bit of coke and I got that energy and I I wrote the song does your mama know about me. Did, did that cause you to go back to the coke to try to write more hits later? No, on? <laughs> no, 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 no. I was uh, uh, luckily I, I became a bodybuilder before I was uh, a dope addict. So yeah, I was always a bodybuilder first, and then I uh, then I would smoke. Man, and also I, I I got very low tolerance. You know the, the Chinese in me. So I, I can't smoke a ton of weed. I can't do any coke at all. Well, actually, I, you were, I, I you were, quit that. You were quoted as saying, "If you smoke pot, eat well, and work out, you'll live forever." Well, that's right. That's <laughs> true. So true. It's so true. I know guys that you know. There's friends of mine, you know, that have been bodybuilding and smoking pot. He's a friend of mine, Zabel. He's 83, 84, and he's he's got a mind, you know, sharp as a tack, and still nice. He's a little bent over now, but you know. He's, <laughs> For 83, he's great. I was going to say one more thing about your musical part of your life when you were playing mm -hmm. at the Elegant Parlor yeah, up there. So Jimmy, Jimmy Hendrix was in the house band? He used to, no, not in the band. He used to come and watch us. He, he would sit, he was an audience. He'd sit there and, and, and listen, listen and play. Did you give him tips, tips on how to play? <laughs> well, I never knew him then. I never knew him. I, he told me later that he was, he'd come up. When I met him, you know, when he was Jimi Hendrix, at that time he was Jimmy Jones, uh -huh. and he lived in Seattle, and all the Seattle guys used to come out and check out Bobby Taylor and the Vancouver's, because Bobby Taylor was this phenomenal singer, still is, and uh, so we we had people we had people drive up from California, from Los Angeles. Would drive nonstop, spend the weekend with us, and then drive back nonstop. Wow. Th that's how good the band was. The band was phenomenal. Oh, we're talking to Tommy Chong. If you didn't recognize his voice already, uh, "Meditations from the Joint" his book. Well, I Chong is is the name of the book, and, and, and "Meditations from the Joint" is what it's about. Oh, the subtitle. Right. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry, I Chong. Right now, yeah, you, mentioned, you mentioned basketball, Jones. So. Uh, 
You want? To, we're going to play that now. Is there any set up? What did that? A great about? story. Do you want a great story? You got a time? Sure, go ahead. <laughs> and Cheech and I, uh, well, Lou Adler is a big basketball fan. You know, he's the guy that sits beside Jack Nicholson's at the Laker game. Right. Yeah, you know, the guy with the, the hat. <laughs> and uh, and we were riding, Cheech and I were riding to the game with Jack Nicholson one night. And Jack, we were late for the game, so Jack pulls his big Mercedes on the wrong side of the road onto the oncoming traffic because there was such a lineup to get in the parking lot. And he drove about, I don't know how many, about half a mile on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> and Cheech was, and Jack driving like a maniac, you know. And Cheech was in the back seat, and he's nervous, and he starts singing, I got a basketball, Jones, got a basketball, Jones, got a basketball, Jones, oh, baby, ooh. <laughs> and the next morning, next day, I we went in the studio, and I says, Let's let's uh, do basketball, Jones. And he said, "What's that?" I said, "You know what you were singing last night." And so I wrote the lyrics. You know the rest of the lyrics. And uh, and then George Harrison was was in the studio when we recorded. So uh, we asked George if he'd play guitar on it. And he said, "Sure." Wow. So he he plays the opening uh, uh, guitar riff on it. It's okay. very, very good. You hear it. Here's a tune uh, inspired by Jack Nichols. Basketball Jones. That's uh, Tommy Chong and Cheech, of course. And uh, I didn't know that uh, George Harrison. George, yeah. yeah. Well, you must uh, spending an evening with you must be a hell of a night. You got stories coming out your ass. I mean, oh, you, oh, so many. So I, many. It, because you hung out in Hollywood in the seventies, which is amazing. You survived that. Well, 60s, to go back to the 60s and 50s, especially, the, I, I started a club in, in Vancouver, and my opening act, or the opening, the act that opened the club was Ike and Tina Turner. I started the clubs, but my brother ran them, you know what I mean? Uh -huh. uh, he, he was he was the general manager. He he took care of the, you know, the money part. I was always lousy with money. You used to be yeah. a strip club, though. Yeah, it was a strip club. Yeah, it was for sale. You know, well, once the club starts doing good, you know, the other clubs, you know, when the ones that aren't that aren't doing so good, you know, end up, you know, being for sale, and we ended up buying it. Is it a true story that you said you didn't have the heart to hire the strippers, so you had them just included them in the improv? <laughs> well, no. What happened? The, the strippers were were great. I mean, they were the heart and soul of of, of the strip club, but it, the show was so boring, and I noticed that people weren't weren't looking at them. You know, even when they took up their clothes, they weren't looking at them. They were drinking. A couple of perverts would be standing there, you know, sitting there staring at them. But they weren't paying attention to them. And I noticed how beautiful these girls were when they come in just wearing their street clothes. They were gorgeous. And then they put on, you know, the makeup and the bows and all that crap. And, and they would, like, disappear into being, you know, just a, like another Vegas-type showgirl. Right. And so what I did, I wrote a, a skit where they would get on stage with their street clothes and then take off, disrobe their street clothes. And, boy, when the first night they did that, the whole joint was very attentive. And you could hear a pin drop. I mean, they were sitting there with their mouth open. You know, here these girls actually, you know, got a, a you know, taken off a real blouse. And then, you know, and, oh, my God, it was the sexiest thing ever. And and, and the skit was uh, called the pajama game. And what it was, the girls pretended that the stage was their bedroom. And they're going to, or, you know, their living room, and they're going to have a pajama party with all the girls, you know, just, you know, getting into it. Well, let's get comfortable. And so they put on their little <laughs> Barbie dolls. Barbie dolls, is that what you call them? Baby, right. Baby dolls. Right. Yeah. And then, and then, uh, and then the, the MC taps, he'd come over with the singer, and they'd knock on the door, and they come in, and, hey, they're on their way to the club. But, hey, Taps, show us your new routine. And so Taps would do his little tap dance. And then Jeannie would sing. And everybody would have a little party. And then the girls would all dance. And that was her skit. Well, then Taps got tired of, of performing because, you know, before I wrote the show, all he had to do was just bring the girls out. So he wasn't used to dancing, you know. <laughs> and so he quit. He, he said, I can't. I'm out of here. So I asked the, uh, the doorman at the time, the guy's name David Graham, Dave, I said, Dave, I need a guy, you know, to do the show. And he says, I'll do it if you do it. 
And so I said, okay. So that, that's, I, that's how I got on stage. And then Dave and I used to do these bits, you know. We'd get bits out of the Playboy magazine, and we'd kind of enact them, you know, so we'd get the sexy stuff. Now, know. Dave was your original partner. He was my original partner. But, but and, the, and then we hired a straight guy. We hired a guy named Rick Lenz. He was a magician. And, you know, he'd, he'd be the, the narc, you know. The, we always had a narc, like a Stadenko. Right. And, and he was straight, and he'd come in, you know, and bust us, and, you know, and we'd be after us and everything and his wife he, you know he's a legitimate stage actor and then his wife found out that he was working in a strip club <laughs> and she, she yarded his ass out of there now you really obviously bad. you really enjoy being on stage is that when you discovered oh that? man when, uh, the first laugh i got i was hooked like a junkie on china white man i was gone <laughs> you mentioned sergeant stadenko just now so let's, 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 let's play that. Tell us a story behind that. Stadenko was a real narc in Vancouver that used to bust all the hippies. And he'd, he would hang out, you know, like in front of our club and wait for us to drive out or to go out and get stoned. And then he'd come and swoop in and try to bust us. <laughs> and so that's why we used to just smoke in the, in, in the club. We never went outside, you know. We'd be looking in the window, looking at the, him, waiting for us to come out. We'd be token away. And one time he busted in my house. He, uh, we had a kid staying at my parents' house and uh david and another david and he was dealing you know lids on the side that they call them lids but you know he's dealing a little pot on the side right for his money and stadenko busted him came into my house in my parents house threw my dad against the wall uh you know he manhandled everybody you know threatened everybody and, and he walked out with david and david did like uh, i think he did a year in jail well, whatever happened for, for dealing to stadenko Stadenko <laughs> ended up after I put him in the movies I made him famous I made him too famous to, to be a narc in Vancouver so they, <laughs> so they shipped his ass off to Turkey he spent 17 years in, in Turkey, Turkey. <laughs> <laughs> and then he came back to Vancouver and I got a call from the the narcs in Vancouver they go, hey Tommy, Tommy this is so and so from the narcotics <laughs> division and he said no 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 don't worry it's not about you know not, not, it's not business he says we're having a we're having a retirement party for Abe Stadenko and we wonder if you could send him a signed poster from up in smoke because all these narcs I says he's retiring he says yeah he doesn't want to you know <laughs> he's like that cop in Barney Miller you know the one that was retired we come around hang around and well that's what happened to Stadenko he came back you know and everything had changed you know his computers and everything else and, and, and the old stuff dark stuff was out so they retired and they came like a you know a golden watch goodbye you know did you send him the poster we sent him the poster <laughs> and uh, this friend of mine josh gilbert who did a, a documentary about me called aka tommy chong right he he got a hold of stadenko and stadenko was still mad at me <laughs> he did not think it was funny yeah i got the poster <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Ah, oh, you know, that chong. <laughs> He's so mad at me. You're listening to the story of Cheech and Chong, as told by Tommy Chong. And there's more. Don't go away. All my friends. Know about the XM. XM Comedy, Channel 150. And now back to the story of Cheech and Chong with our very special guest, Tommy Chong. His book is called I Chong, a Meditations from the Joint, written uh, in his recent nine months in jail. We'll get to that in a minute, but we just got up to the movie part. Now, you went from Canada, being a musician, a musician, rather, Loving on stage, you met uh, Cheech was driving a truck up there, wasn't he? Cheech was uh, actually delivering carpets on the side for, he got five bucks an hour for delivering carpets. And he was also a freelance writer in a hippie magazine. And that's when I met him. I met him out at the magazine. It was like a you know little um, alley weekly or whatever, you know, just one of those little hippie mags. Right. And uh, a mutual friend introduced us, and he said that... Uh, he said, this guy should be, work really well on your show. And I was looking for a straight guy because Rick got taken away <laughs> by his wife. 
And Cheech had, he was a little guy with a short hair, and he looked like a little Iranian, you know. I didn't know, I, I had no clue what he was. And I didn't find out he was Mexican until we got to L.A. Really? I had, yeah, he wouldn't tell us. And, you know, he just was, you know, a straight little guy. He was trying to be a you know, little white guy from, from L.A. But we knew, you know, he was something, obviously, a little dark guy. And so we ended up, he ended up, like, understudying. He was the understudy for Dave. And he did do a little bit on his own, but he ended up, uh, when, when the whole thing fell apart, you know, after nine months, you know, the, 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 my brother, you know, we were losing money because we, we turned the audience from a bunch of drunken bikers into some attentive theater, theater goers. Uh -huh. And theater goers are the cheapest nerds on earth you know they, they'll sip a wine all night or water or <laughs> just have a uh, little soda please perrier you. yeah perrier and you know the bikers are hey bring another round you know so we we, we were losing money because they would we, we were packing the place with theater goers so my brother wanted to go back to the old strip routine you know and so uh, so everybody broke up and you know the everybody went their separate ways the girl went back dancing you know what they were doing and and Dave didn't want to keep doing it. And Cheech was the only one left. And so Cheech and I started the band. We were going to play music because Cheech was a singer and I was a guitar player. And I always had this feeling that I would eventually go back playing music. But we put a band together. And when we went to our first job, which was like a, in, a, in a big arena, it was like a battle of the bands. We, Cheech and I went up and I said well let's do some comedy first and so we started doing comedy and we never did get around to playing music <laughs> not one note so you're telling me note. Cheech and John originally got together to be a band yeah yeah wow yeah. and then Cheech just lately you know he wanted to do the same thing you know put a band together but you know no, no, I'm, I'm too much of a comedian you know at what point do you guys go down to Los Angeles well after we that that gig, we we played uh, about three. We played a full club in Vancouver, you know, just to make sure that that we were on the right track. Mm -hmm. That was the night we saw a T Bone Walker at the, at the end of his career, and that's where the bit we do Blind Man and Chitlin. I got that off uh, T Bone Walker. T Bone Walker came out. He was so drunk that he, he started playing his guitar out of tune. It was They had loosened the strings for the flight, oh, yeah. and he had no one had tuned it up for him. <laughs> You're kidding me. So he's they were that and, loose? And he's, they're that loose. They were so loose, the bass player was t tightening them up just to, just to get some kind of you know tension in the strings. And not only, T-Bone was so drunk, he couldn't, he was strumming away the blah, 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 you know, just to go strumming. And then he couldn't remember any of the lyrics. He was going, ah, or zip. <laughs> and I swear to God, man, at, I was I was standing there with my mouth open. Cheech and I both were looking at this guy, you know, this this old decrepit man. And when he finished his set, the crowd went nuts. They were clapping. They go, oh, "What a genius!" All right, there's a tribute to the blues. Is only Cheech and Chong can present it. Now, <laughs> you're talking about, I interrupted your story. We're talking to Tommy Chong, by the way, on Stand Up, Sit Down, XM Comedy. Uh, you, you, you go down to Los Angeles now. You originally were going to be a band, but you, uh, Cheech and you uh, did some comedy in the world. Well, comedy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, when we went to L.A., you know, it was comedy. Although I had my guitar, you know. And uh, every once in a while I'd bring it out, but it was comedy, strictly, strictly comedy. So I, when we got to L.A., I was still married to my first wife, Maxine. And so we stayed, we all stayed at Maxine's place. And Cheech slept on the couch. And that's where we got the bit, we were up in smoke, you know. He'd, he woke up in the morning and stepped in the cereal bowl. And that really happened. Because <laughs> he, he was sleeping on the couch. And my girls at the time would get up for school. And they'd get up and turn on the television like he wasn't in the room. You know? <laughs> and they'd eat their breakfast. And, and they'd be, you're going to be late for school. And they'd do the conversation. Cheech is trying to sleep. <laughs> and then, uh, so then I, I, I had purchased... Uh, a Honda 90, and so Cheech and I would we'd get on the Honda 90 and go to different clubs. And the first club we played at was Red Fox's club on La Cienega. And Red Fox, I'd known Red from the from my After Hours Blues Club, 
because he was a steady customer and so I and he knew me from the band and everything and and we were good friends and so I phoned Red and, and Red uh, said yeah come on down man you got a club yeah and he was out of town so I went down there Cheech and I went down there and uh, and we performed uh, and for Norma Miller uh, she's another black comedian she was actually in in the Ken Burns jazz thing she's a jazz dancer a blues a, j a jive dancer and she she was emceeing and <laughs> she introduced us and yeah, ladies and gentlemen here's the two guys from Canada geek and gank <laughs> <laughs> That's what she, she couldn't pronounce Cheech and Chong. So many of the black clubs couldn't, they couldn't pronounce Cheech and Chong. It was Geek and Gang, Chi and Chan. Uh, they, they'd mess it up. Now, did you go uh, up the stage and do uh, pot humor right from the beginning? No, no. Uh, we did a lot. We were we were in a sex uh, thing. You know, we did a lot of sex jokes. You know, I was just saying, cause, uh, I was wondering what club would welcome you with open arms, and you answered the question when you said Red Fox. But I mean, yeah. so what did you start out doing, basically? We, we, we started out, well, there was a group called, well, Second City. You know, I, I had seen, when I was on the blues, uh, Chitlin circuit, I, we'd go to Chicago. And instead of going to blues clubs, I'd go to Second City. And then when we were in San Francisco playing, instead of going to nightclubs, I'd, I'd go to uh, the committee. Right. And, and so that's where I got my, my roots. And I, we, Cheech and I would do committee bits. You know, there's like Old Man in the Park and all sorts of these, um, you know, the surprise party for the old guy and that. And and we, we you know, we did those bits. And then when we, when we went to L.A., you know, Cheech and I had a big repertoire of, of those committee bits. But when we went to Fox's, we did a few. And then we did, uh, you know, some stand-up. And it was mostly sex jokes. And So where did the pot uh, part come in? The, what well, inspired that? Came, that? that came later. That came when uh, we we'd been doing we'd been doing uh, all these little clubs, mostly black clubs, and then we started playing the troubadour. And the troubadour was, was you know it was like a lot of potheads and you know what do you call them? You know uh, Janis Joplin and right. Joni Mitchell and all those. It was a folk club. And so then, and they got started getting our pot humor. But we were in the valley in Los Angeles, and, and in between shows. And I said that she, you know, we, the first show was went poorly because it was a dance club, and it was called the Irma Hotel. It was the club, and 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 they were dancers, and they didn't want to stop dancing to watch comedy. Right. And so, so when we did our show, we weren't that well received. Whereas in the black clubs, they were ready for a floor show. These white clubs, you know, they weren't. They wanted to dance. And so I said to teach, you know, there must be a character you, you, you can do that, you know, that can relate to these people. And he said, yeah, he knew. He said, yeah, there is one, but I, I, I don't want to do it. And I said, why? He said, well, it's kind of, you know, detrimental to uh, the Chicano community. And what it is, is that all the Chicanos, they have what you call family humor. This is the, the, the jokes. They, they, they imitate, you know, their cousins or brothers or uncles, whatever. Right. Uh, you know, from Mexico. You know, you know, with the accents and everything else. So this was kind of humor. It was like family humor. Cheech didn't want to share, you know. And I and I told him, "Come on, man. You know, we have to. You know, <laughs> we're greedy. You know, we're we're you know, we have to." And I says, "If if it's funny, you know, that's all it counts." And so he says, "Okay." And he showed me the bit. You know, he, you know, hey man, what's up? And I said, "Oh, perfect." So I, there was an old black comedy routine that I remembered from you know my my days with Motown where I would watch these black comedians and this one black comedian did a bit called uh, the the date he'd be driving a car and he'd stop first of all he'd clean up his car you know he'd do a funny uh, pantomime of cleaning his car up making it all nice and then he'd go pick up his date and he'd get the date in the car and so when she showed me you know told me about the character I, I kind of showed him the bit you know but especially the bit about what, polishing the car and then I said, and you pick me up. I'm a, I'm a hitchhiker, and I'll be the stoner. I'll be a, like the stoner hitchhiker. And she says, okay. So we went on stage that night, and we did it, the second show. And as soon as she says, hey, Red Freak, want to ride, man? As soon as he said that, man, <laughs> the, the joint just, it was like electricity. The whole place just roared. They recognized his character. It was pure L.A. And from that point on, man, that, that character was like 50, a good, it started out maybe 10, 
20, 30, 40, 50, and then it became like 75% of the show. And then then eventually 100%. We're talking to Tommy Chong on Stand Up, Sit Down, XM Comedy. Uh, is there a story on Sister Mary Elephant? Well, Cheech, you know, we had to do something, you know, something about school, you know, and Cheech had gone to uh, Catholic school. Oh, yeah. We were, we were testing the mic. And Cheech would always uh, act crazy for the for the uh, engineer, you know, and so the engineer would needed a needed a a level, and so Cheech <laughs> screamed, "Shut up!" as loud as he could, and and, and you know the needle would did a pin right over there and so then i said oh okay and so then we wrote this bit you know with uh, me giving the boring the boring what i did in my summer vacation we're talking to tommy chow he's got a book out called uh i chow meditations from the joint in 85 you guys you and tom or cheech rather than split up yeah. and uh, to quote you cheech was closer than a wife the only thing we didn't do was have sex it was like a death in the family i don't know if i'll ever get over it was your quote at, at the time. That's now, true. That's what what true. did he uh, tell you? Because it was his idea. What did he tell you? Why? It was kind of a weird kind of chicken shit way of doing it. I had no idea he resented the fact that I directed. You know, I had control. And I had, I had certain souls. And I needed control, you know, in order to, to get what I did, what I got out of him. But he, um, he just didn't want to be that guy anymore he wanted to show the world you know that he was much more intelligent than than you know that dumb chicano the beaner right the beaner yeah that kind of thing you know because even even in the corsican brothers you know there there's a part in the corsican brothers where i'm i'm a revolutionary right and she says well, you know why do you have to be a revolutionary all the time man why can't you just you know just be normal you know why do you have and you know and I, and I always you know and I was always on the edge and he got tired of living on the edge and and so he just wanted out he wanted out and there's no other way around it. How did that he happen? wrote a song called uh, uh, Born in East L.A. You know right and uh, and then uh, what's his name Frank Price the president of Columbia they him and Cheech got together and they decided well, hey why don't we do a movie without Chong and uh, they did. And that that broke that broke the string. That that broke a lot of things. It broke broke my heart because uh, you know I was never. I always made sure that Cheech was you know like the, he had the funniest lines. I made sure that he had. Uh, the yeah, you were the basically you were the straight man to him ninety yeah. like percent yeah. of the time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, of course they say though it takes a lot of talent to be a great straight man. I mean, well, <laughs> uh, well, uh, well uh, it's just restraint, you know. Just know I knew you know. See, I know. Uh, I've got a built-in respect for for audiences, and I think that's what directors, you know, natural directors have. You know, when they do a project, they know they see it through the audience eyes, and and that's what I've always done since I was ten years old playing music. That you know, the fiddle player used to tell me, you know, you know, give the people what they want, and don't be out there too long. And if they want the same song over and over again, give it to them. That's right. what they want to hear. And and that's. That was always been my my uh, credo, and uh, to this day, it's still the same. You Cheech, on the other hand, he didn't want to, you know, he, he wanted to move on. You know, he, he Cheech gets bored real easy, and so you know, oh, he was bored with doing this. I want to do something else, and and you can see, you know, with his acting, you know, he went with Don Johnson, you know, he did the Tin Cup, he did, you know, he did a lot of uh, you know diverse uh, characters, and you know, he's still and he's you know Cars, voiceover with Cars, mm -hmm. you know, he's he's got a busy little guy he's what? a busy little guy would you have done anything without him before the breakup you mean yeah no no i i i, I got offered uh, a directing job which i took but I, I would never do anything in front of a camera without cheech really until, until he until i was forced to and then even then after you know like i did the uh, far out man and i had him play a cameo you know, I wanted him to be in it more, but he said, no, he says, it's over, it's gone. We're talking to Tommy Chung. Let's move on to television, because you've done a lot of TV. Yeah. Uh, most memorable, or one of the more memorable roles is on the 70s show, which you did yeah. for several years. You had to stop and do a little prison time there, but other than that, yeah. you played Leo. Um, how did they treat you on that set? Were you like an icon to those guys? I was, well, not so much to the actors, but to the writers and to the... Um, 
to the old guys I remember. A lot of the crew guys were were cameramen in that and when we did Up in Smoke and all the uh, the movies. Really? So I knew those guys from from back in the day. You know, when they were young kids, it was it was great. The the writers and the the producers and that. They they were kind of they were great you know but you know they're so straight you know and and Fox had everybody so worried about you know being politically correct you know so they they would let me do anything you know <laughs> I couldn't get it you know I'd try to ad lib a little bit and they'd, they'd sh you know shut it down. Isn't it weird that uh, you're you're well known for you know being a stoner okay i i, I still consider that contemporary humor because mm -hmm. it's it's recent but yet it's been around long enough to where this the crew some of them don't know who you are isn't it weird yeah well <laughs> the kids it was more more than any anything it was the kids that didn't know they also do her on the uh, simpsons of course and in south park selling the cherokee hair tail uh, that's, that that's was the best, best. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great show. Tommy Chong has written a book called I Chong. Uh, Operation Pipe Dreams, which was the government's uh, crackdown on, uh, I guess for some reason, they, there's, a, there's a great fear of paraphernalia sales. But you're, the, the, the website that was selling paraphernalia that you got busted for uh, wasn't really yours, was it? No, it was my son's, and, right. and it was entrapment, pure entrapment. They they set up, the DEA set up a phony head shop in in Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania, and they tried for almost a year to get us to send them bongs across the mail, uh, you know, across the state line, and we wouldn't do it because uh, you know my son's company knew better, and so I think I'm guessing, but I'm I'm pretty sure that they put an undercover agent in into the shop because the guy ended up, uh, you know, the guy flew the the agent flew to LA, bought the bought the bongs, five thousand dollars worth, and they had the agent ship and and, and that, that broke the law. And what they did, they they were instead of coming after me, they, they said, Listen, if you don't give up, you know, we're gonna make you a deal. If you don't take the deal, we're gonna go after your son and your wife because my wife signed a check right. for the money to start the business. And that's why you took the nine months, right? And that's why I did the nine months, yeah. You would have to presume that they were after you because of your image and yeah. you thought you'd yeah. be a great example of some kind. Well they they thought a lot of things. They thought for sure that I really was that stoner guy. They thought I would have a lot of prior arrests so that would be a slam dunk when it came down to, you know, you know, saying, you know, uh, it was a uh, weapons of mass destruction theory, you know. They thought for sure that I would have a lot of priors. I mean, you know, 68 years old or 66 at the time. So, and, and what they did, they found out I had none. I was clean as a whistle. I was surprised me, man. I had to go back and check again, you know. Are you sure? I, I had no priors, and so they, uh, they still put me in jail. I understand you know? one of the things that really pissed you off was their argument about drugs, uh, paraphernalia, supporting terrorism. They always bring that up. Oh, they say that we're making billions of dollars. Billions of dollars. I mean, it's so ridiculous. Those, well, then it's not when you think of that the de, you think of uh, the industries that that the, the drug war supports. You know, like the prison industry. You know, all the prisons, all the federal prisons are privately owned. Uh, you know, and and all the garments that people buy for the prisons that's privately owned. It's Halliburton, and then they got uh, you know they got this war on drugs. You know, the DEA. I mean, they get billions of dollars from the government to fight this non-existent war on drugs. Well, it says here when you were in prison, you were a friendly con. What does that mean? They liked you? Is that as simple as that? They just liked you? Well, you know? the way, the thing is about prison, you know, if you want to do your time and get out of there really quick, you have to be super nice. You have to be, you know, uh, you know, you can't give any attitude. Everything depends on attitude, even the way you look at them. You know, if they tell you to move and you don't move right away, they consider that you know your your a bad attitude. And if you got a bad attitude, they can they can keep you in jail for as long as they want. There's been guys in jail, man. There's been guys. I've seen guys with release papers signed by judges, and they're still in jail because the bureau of prisons. Oh, they forgot. You know, they lost that paperwork. Right. They just don't feel like letting the guy out. You got no. Uh, uh, protection. There's no one on your side. I mean, it's up to them. They decide whether you, you know whether you 
uh, where you live, what you eat, where you what, everything. And so uh, the best way to do it, to do your time, is to to act weird <laughs> and and stay out of the eye line, eye line, you know, stay out of sight, and and always, always, always give uh, you know give a nice vibe. So you you didn't have to be anybody's bitch while you were in there. Well, that's all a fallacy, you know. The truth is, man, you know all that Bubba stuff and that. It's all tr it's not true. It, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> you, you braggart! If you ain't no fucking looker, I'll tell you that. <laughs> no, no one hit on me. I felt kind of bad about yeah, it. Yeah. The barber, the barber was gay, and, and and he never even hit on me. No one hit on me, man. I felt really You're bad crushed. about it. Right? Yeah, I was, I was kind of. But then, you know, I'm an old guy, so I can understand. <laughs> it. You lost your ass in the '90s, right? <laughs> yeah, long time ago. Yeah, but <laughs> while you were in there, you read the I Ching, and uh, consequently, you decided to write some of your own, and that's. That's the book, which That's is out book. called I Chong, uh, Meditations from the Joint. It says, when you have dignity, says Tommy Chong, you have respect. And, sir, you just got my respect. You always have, as a matter of fact. Thank you. You're great. Tommy, many more years. Thanks, brother. And thanks for all the great, great times you brought us. My pleasure. been listening to the story of Cheech and Chong, as told by Tommy Chong. I'm Sonny Fox, and I want to thank Tommy very much for taking the time to share a great story with all of us. And I'll see you next time for another great XM Comedy special on the world's first uncensored radio station. XM Comedy. XM Comedy 150.